Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming out. It's a beautiful day today. I could probably think of about 50 things I'd rather do, like get my grill fired up, but I really appreciate everybody coming out and taking the time. You know, a lot of folks, a lot of folks know that AFP historically has done a tax day event. And we've basically had one, uh, the ch chapter was founded in 2008, we had our first tax day event in 2009. And that, that first one was in, in front of the state house, a couple hundred people were there, it was, a, it was a great event, and it was really at the time what a lot of people called the, basically the beginning of the Tea Party movement. But today I want to point out, and today we're going to go in a different direction, but because before there was a Tea Party, there was a Pine Tree Riot. <laughs> Very good. And I would tell you, I would tell you that without, without the Pine Tree Riot, there might have never been a Boston Tea Party. So this is a highly important event in New Hampshire's history. We have some fantastic speakers here today. Um, we're going to talk about just how important New Hampshire's role was in the formation of, of the revolution that ultimately led to our independence as a nation and our freedom and the liberties that we hold here taking our freedoms back because we will not tolerate someone else taking our property away without, without our just, justification, people coming and, and taking what's important from us. Americans and, and particularly the people in New Hampshire will stand up and fight for their, for their rights and they're not going to be denied. So we have some great folks here today to speak about the history and it's a fantastic history. I really want to uh, take the opportunity to, uh, to let everybody know there is food. Bathrooms in the back. Uh, if you need, everyone needs to use the bathroom, so uh, really appreciate the, uh, the the great turnout. And I want to start with our first speaker, who's going to talk a little bit about the Pine Tree Riot and why New Hampshire really was first in the nation way before we had presidential primaries. So with that, I'm going to start with Charlie Arlinghouse. President of the Josiah Bartlett Center. Uh, that's a, a think tank based in Concord, and he's had, had a long, fantastic history with uh, American history. So he's going to talk a little bit about about the history of the Pine Tree. Um, hi, thanks for having me. Um, so I got a degree at one point in my life. Uh, I have a master's degree in colonial American history, which has done me no good whatsoever. Well, <clears throat> the only good thing it did is in grad school I met the. Uh, woman to whom I've been married for 25 years, so it's all good. That's good. Um, but this is one of the first times and only times I get to actually talk at least a little tiny bit about history, so I'm happy, I'm very happy to be here and very happy to do that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, about pine tree riots, about trees, and I don't want to step on most of what anybody else is going to say because I don't know anything about trees, and that was borne out to me when I was talking before we started with Tom Thompson, and I realized exactly how little I know except I can tell the difference between a pine and a maple, or at least a pine and something that doesn't have needles on it um, <clears throat> in my backyard. Um, although I tapped a couple trees this year and all of them delivered something resembling sap, so I'm okay. Um, in, New Hampshire is a funny state and it was a funny province and we have a weird history as a province. Most of it is incredibly disreputable and not anything to be terribly proud of. We are, a, we are a state full of drunks, and, and that, was our, that was our history. People tended to get drunk and do things. It's not actually that different anymore, and if you've been to the legislature, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> At least I hope that's what's going on, because I can't believe they actually think that way. Um, except, except those of you here, obviously. Um, there are exceptions to this. Um, the answer was a weird, barren, godforsaken little rock. And it was very, it's very hard to do things on godforsaken little rocks. And, uh, and people, there's a, there's, a great, um, there's a great history by Forrest McDonald where, where at some point he describes um, New Hampshire as a, uh, as a state where it was so cold in the winter that everybody stayed inside and got their wives pregnant. And then uh, when the summer came, they went outside and got somebody else's wife pregnant. Uh, and he, <clears throat> he cites a whole lot of town records to prove his point. Um, <clears throat> They only, go to ch they only went to church when it was time to fire their minister. Um, that's actually not that different from today. Um, and that they, uh, which is sad, but it's true. Um, uh, and that uh, they would occasionally meet in town meetings, <clears throat> only to decide not to send state, state representatives to, or send representatives to, um, to Concord or Portsmouth or Exeter, um, and to not pay the state tax. Um, so 
some things really shouldn't change. Um, we'd actually be a lot better off if a couple of towns didn't send their state reps to Concord if I get to nominate the towns. Where being an obvious exception, <laughs> Representative Kirk. Um, but one of the things that we, we did do, it's very hard to make a living in a state like New Hampshire, but, uh, but the timber industry, and Tom's gonna to talk about the timber industry, has always been very important in New Hampshire. It was very important here. It was also very important to the English crown. It was very important because they didn't like importing a whole lot of trees from the Baltic states, which is where they, the Baltic countries, which is where they got a lot of their, um, a lot of their trees before, and you had to go through the Baltic Sea and get held hostage by, by Sweden, who back then might actually hold people hostage. Today, they would just be polite and let you go through <clears throat> and tax you. Um, but but uh, the trees were here, and apparently pine has qualities to it, which I don't quite completely understand, except I do notice in my backyard that they tend to sway a lot and not fall over. At least most of them don't fall over. But apparently that quality is really good when you're making a ship's mast. So they singled out some trees for ship's, ship's masts. And we're gonna talk about the difference between 24 inch trees and 10 inch trees. For the most part, any tree in the woods <clears throat> that was suitable for a mast um, was subject to the, to the king, particularly trees over 24 inches in diameter. At some point they lowered that. This was always a problem even when they didn't lower it. When, Massachusetts, when New Hampshire was under control of Massachusetts in the, uh, in the early part of the 1700s, this was also a problem. The law was never a problem when it wasn't enforced. When the surveyors didn't walk through the woods marking trees, then it's not a big deal. No law is actually a problem if it's not enforced, generally speaking. Um, and it was, it was like this. But we had a history of problems, um, and, and they got worse and worse. There was a, a series of riots, uh, there was a riot called the, the Mass Tree Riot, which occurred in, in what was then Exeter um, in 1754, I believe it was. And it was actually fairly similar to something that people in New Hampshire like to do, and it involved a great deal of alcohol. <clears throat> Basically, the Surveyor General was the Lieutenant Governor assigned to New Hampshire, um, but, uh, but out, of, uh, out of Boston, because the governors of New Hampshire and Massachusetts were all based, uh, back then, were based in Boston, and there was a lieutenant governor uh, whose job was to like the viceroy to take care of New Hampshire. Um, and he was, on, he was also the surveyor general. He went on a tirade, and he was, gonna, he was gonna find people for taking down their trees. Well, he made the mistake of letting people know he was gonna do that. Some local townspeople said, yeah, there's some other people here who aim to kill you. Um, there's some dispute over whether they really meant to kill him or not. But I gather when you're the guy who might be getting killed, that you try to err on the side of caution. Um, but they were staying in an inn over in, uh, over in Exeter Way, down Exeter Way, in what I think is now Brentwood, but I won't swear to that. Um, and uh, a bunch of guys got really, really drunk one night. He had 10, uh, ten guys with him who also got a little drunk. Um, but they were his hired hands. But the other guys who got drunk uh, uh, basically broke in and, and disguised themselves and basically, as Indians in this particular case, and basically um, beat the snot out of everybody who didn't run. Um, and that's the New Hampshire way. <laughs> and that's what we do. Um, fast forward many years, um, actually not that many years, but fast forward to 1772. There's a lot going on at, at this point, and, and Dan is gonna talk at some point about the, the general climate and a lot of the problems that exist in, in that time based on the ideology, based on the, the government overseas, the people far away in London, becoming much more obnoxious and having a lot more to do with us. When, for the most part, the people in New Hampshire wanted to be left alone to get drunk and make their wives pregnant. Um, I don't know how the wives felt about that. But, um, I suspect that, actually I suspect I do know how the wives felt about that. Because um, I'm pretty sure, I don't, I don't claim to understand how women think, but I'm pretty sure that is every woman's dream for a drunk, smelly man to come home drunk at 11 o'clock in the morning and decide he wants to have a baby, or he wants you to have a baby. Um, but be that as it may, <clears throat> it's also the, the New Hampshire way. We wanted to be left alone, but they were, they were interfering with us in greater and greater ways. There was generally um, a lot of angst over this. The Stamp Act was, was a major problem. But basically, in New Hampshire, we cared a lot less than most other states. There are a number of things where, you know, Virginia and Massachusetts were very involved very upset about the way things are going on. And New Hampshire kind of didn't bother too much. And they were a little less active than some of the other states. Then, some idiot 
uh, his name was Wentworth, by the way, um, decided to mess with timber. And people thought about this, well, do what you want, but you know, don't, don't take our alcohol and don't take our trees. And those were the two biggest problems that, uh, that we were likely to encounter. Um, the governor, the, one of the most famous colonial governors is Benning Wentworth, <clears throat> who was governor for about 25 years, and is generally regarded by colonial historians as a model of efficiency and a model of administration, and he kept New Hampshire peaceful and peaceable. He reigned, uh, if that's the right word, between <clears throat> the uh, master, uh, mastery riot and the pine tree riot. Um, he, let, he came in shortly after the uh, mastery riot and left shortly before the pine tree riot. The way he governed was to leave people alone and try not to do anything and try not to enforce any of the laws. <laughs> a bad guy, right? Um, he's a royal governor, and there's a big picture of him, a, a very nice portrait that I would uh, like to, steal, to borrow in the state house um, of him, but like a lot of uh, rich people in the time, he's wearing like breeches, and he looks a little, bit stockings, he looks a little goofy, but he left people alone so he can look as goofy as he wants. Um, but what happened at some point, he got into a lot of trouble. He kept granting, he kept making grants to towns that were in, that were in Vermont. Not that there was a Vermont at the time, but it's a big fight with New York over you know, who, who's entitled to that land. And at some point, they got rid of him. And um, they put in uh, John Wentworth, who I believe was his nephew. Well, John, unlike his father, was an idiot. Um, and uh, I don't want to say that too much because. Um, no, actually, he probably was an idiot. You could probably prove that. But he, uh, and, and we're going to talk about how he proved to be an idiot. Um, so what happened is, there's this horrible law where the trees on your property that are most valuable, you don't get to cut down. And if you're caught cutting them down, you get fined, or if things are bad enough, you get jailed. And it's an enormous cost to you, and maybe you have to pay somebody to survey the land. That law is horrible, but it's not so bad if it's not enforced. And if under Benning Wentworth, nobody surveys your land, they leave you to make your living as best you can. Keeping in mind that New Hampshire in the 1700s was like Detroit. In Detroit, nobody has a job that's not part of the auto industry. And in New Hampshire, pretty much, nobody has a job that's not related at somehow, on some level, to a tree. <clears throat> and, uh, which is a good thing, we like trees. Um, well, what John Wentworth decided to do was decide to start enforcing the law, because that's what we need to do, and, and I'm going to go find a lot of people, and they went around and they find a whole bunch of people in the early part of 1772, um, and they sent someone to get it, you can't cut this wood, you've been found, mills in particular, you've been found in possession of this many trees that you're not supposed to have. Um, there were intercessions back and forth with Portsmouth, which is where government was based on, um, which was probably just as bad then as it would be now. Um, <laughs> That's not true. Not everybody in Portsmouth is a horrible person. Um, I met one once. Um, it's a good guy, really. Um, and uh, um, remember that if you're thinking of going to Steve Marchand for governor, by the way, which you can take either way. Um, not that I would encourage anybody not to look for Frank or anyone else running for governor who's here. Um, so what happened is there was a group of uh, most of the people who were um, who were uh, attacked by this agreed at the end of the day to pay a small fine and go home. But there was a group of people in Ware who didn't want to pay a fine and didn't want to go home. And at some point, long story short, they couldn't come to an agreement and they sent out the sheriff. Um, the Hillsborough County Sheriff came out and, uh, and he's a decent guy and he wanted to either arrest people or get them to pay a fine. He sees them. Uh, on the first night, and he says, you know, I'm gonna, and they agree to come up with a deal, and I'll see you in the morning. They retire to an inn in Ware, which I'm sure was quite lovely um, back then, and um, not that it isn't lovely now, but I don't know if there are any inns in Ware today. Um, <clears throat> they reti retire to an inn for the night. <clears throat> the people who wanted to help out their friend who was gonna have to pay a fine, a group, of, uh, a number of people were gonna have to pay fines, decided to go with a New Hampshire traditional way of helping people out to pay for it. And that is to say, they got drunk. <laughs> and they, I'm sorry, they uh, went to a, uh, a tavern and uh, partake, partook of uh, liquid refreshment. And um, like most people 
who make their best decisions when they're drunk, they decided that the thing to do, the thing to resort to was violence. Um, it's an economic protest. It's a form of economic protest, and I'm going to caution you to say this much, that I am in favor of economic protest. I am hostile to the notion of the king not letting you cut down the trees on your lawn, on your, on your lawn. On your, I grew up in the suburbs, I swear. And um, <clears throat> let cut down the trees on your property. Um, and I am very sympathetic to that. However, uh, what I'm about to describe is not a solution that I'm recommending for all of you. Um, and I think government officials here should take some, uh, some solace in that um, suggestion. Um, they basically knocked on the sheriff's door very early in the morning or very late at night, depending on your perspective. Um, late at night for the drunk guys, early in the morning for the sheriff, because um, those two times eventually merge. And, um, <clears throat> and he, said, he said, hang on while I get ready. And his version of getting ready was to grab his pistols, because he kind of figured out what was happening. They kept him from grabbing his pistols. They essentially grabbed him, held him by his arms and feet above the ground, splayed him, and, uh, and the people who were going to get fined instead chose to cross out their account on his naked body. Um, some people would argue that they beat him within an inch of his life. Um, I would argue they beat him within an inch of his life. I'm opposed to this, by the way, as a tax protest. If you go down to the DRA next week and beat the commissioner within an inch of his life, there will be not a whole lot of sympathy for you. Nonetheless, we do have a nice flag um, related to this here. Um, that didn't go over really well, as you might imagine. Um, they also took the deputy and they got at the deputy by essentially taking out the floorboards of the room above him and poking him with a lot of big sticks from above, which is also fairly effective, although not within an inch of his life. The, uh, the sheriff and his deputy were not happy about this. Um, apparently fairly proud men and they didn't like how this happened to them. Um, by the way, again, this is, this is sort of a, uh, something from New Hampshire tradition as well. In the Dover Indian Massacre of 1689, um, that's exactly how they uh, uh, killed Major Richard Waldron at the time. We used to not deal very nicely with the Indians, like he would say his, his fist weighed a pound, which if you know how scales work, that you can kind of push down a little too hard and <clears throat> make the weight come off screwball, but they, you know, they cut off his fist and stuffed it in his mouth, and then the Indians all crossed out their account on his body too. In his case, he died. <clears throat> in our friend Sheriff Whiting's case, he did not die. Um, but he was, he was angry, he lost a lot of blood, um, and they did beat him, you know, theoretically, within an inch of his life um, as a form of protest. To make matters worse, um, these people, patriots all, didn't like horses either. So they, um, they basically took the horses and they cut off the tails and the manes and the ears. And, which, I, frankly, I think is a little harsh, because, you know, what did the horse have to do? It's not the horse's law. The horse had nothing to do with this, and you're going to cut off the poor horse's ears. But apparently, in 1772, it is particularly humiliating to ride down the street in a horse that doesn't have ears or hair. Um, and somehow that really showed them. It's, I guess it's the equivalent of making you, you drive home in a Yugo. <laughs> Um, so that's, uh, so that's, the, that's the Pine Tree Riot. Um, and there's a big part of us today that looks at this and says that's both wonderful and horrible at the same time. And that's sort of where I am, right? I, I get the protest, I get what they were mad about, not really enamored of their former protest, and, and it's why occasionally I have um, <clears throat> not horrible sympathies for the Boston Tea Party either, but um, that's a whole other story. But nonetheless, people around the state were quite sympathetic to this. Um, people were very unsympathetic to anything to do with the British. And part of what was going on here is, I mean, part of it, it was a, it was a rougher time, and of course a lot of people were drunk. Um, and that always helps, because a lot of things seem clearer when you're drunk. Um, and so that's going on. But a lot of it is, is people understood that, that the biggest problem we were facing was a threat to our livelihood. And there was a, there was a what was, becoming essentially a foreign power overseas that was imposing itself on us, writing rules and regulations that we have nothing to do with, um, and threatening people's livelihood in ways that were not sensible. They weren't modest forms of taxation to pay for your community. They were a whole bunch of things that could have a dramatic effect on your ability to make money in the dominant industry of the day um, in a way that was dictated by a bunch of people overseas 
who clearly had no idea what we faced. And I think that's why the Pine Tree Riots resonate today. It's not because we're in favor of dragging people naked out of bed and, uh, and beating them until they're bloody. Some of us are, but not all of us are. And, uh, but it's, in, it's that we understand that um, economic coercion and a, and a taxation that, that takes into account only the needs of the king um, is not sympathetic to the people. Is not uh, is not conducive to the rights of a free people, and is not conducive to a just and peaceful society. And with that, I'm going to shut up for a while. Thank you, Charlie. I, I really enjoyed uh, not just the depth, but but the graphic nature of your presentation. <laughs> So, it's absolutely true, the, 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 the Pine Tree Riot, the significance of the Pine Tree Riot is, is substantial, not just in the, in the nature of, of that if people rose up against uh, an unjust, distant, um, distant uh, lawmaking process that didn't recognize our rights and what was important to us, um, but that fundamental component is, is really uh, something that's truly in the New Hampshire tradition. But that New Hampshire tradition extends beyond just the Pine Tree Riot, and uh, Representative Dan Itze is going to come and talk a little bit about some of the other components of the Pine Tree Riot and, some of the, and where it fits in, in, in New Hampshire's history. So, Representative Dan Itze. Thank you. you know, when I moved to New Hampshire in 1994, I moved into a really nice neighborhood in Fremont. And I was politically active then, but then I got elected to the legislature in 2000 and began serving in 2001. And I, realize something. I live in a, in a little development called Mass Tree Estates. And if you go out to the main road, just kind of at the end of my street, there's a placard. And I live pretty much at the site of the Mass Tree Riots. How cool is that? You guys know me. Uh, now, you have to understand what the Mass Tree Riot was about. This is 1734. And what we weren't allowed to take was the two-foot trees. And, but hey, there are trees, or they're on our land, and we were cutting them down. Well, the Surveyor General, David Dunbar, he says he's going to come out and he's going to inspect the fallen trees. That's an important aspect of the fallen trees. You weren't allowed to cut down trees 24 inches or greater in diameter, but if a tree fell down, you could harvest it. You know, and that's where the term windfall profits comes from. <laughs> now, so the Severe General is coming out and he's going to inspect the fallen trees. He's going to see, did they really fall? Well, what happened was we learned of this and a bunch of men gathered near the mill and they chased the inspector off by, or the surveyor off by uh, discharging their firearms. And, and he left. And he returned with 10 men, as you were told. And the locals dressed up as Indians and chased him off to a local tavern. Maybe they, I don't know if they beat him or they all drank together, but they chased him off. Now, one of the more interesting things I learned two terms ago, you think this is an old problem? Did you know that we still have tree wardens? Every town is allowed to authorize a tree warden. The tree wardens have control of the trees in your public right away. So if you've got a tree that's within so many feet of the road and you want to cut it down, you have to get permission to cut it down and the town can say no, or the town can say that tree has to go. So we still don't control our trees, at least not in the absolute sense. But this whole issue of ownership and property brought us really first to the front in the war for independence too. You ever, everybody thinks that the first battle of the war for independence was Lexington and Concord, right? Shall I have heard around the world? No. It was the Battle of Fort William and Mary. And that happened in December of 1774. What about that? 1774. So, what happened was we had just paid a heavy tax. Now, that's before, that's before uh, Lexington and Concord. We had just paid a heavy tax to buy arms and munitions for the fort. And the people looked at that 
those munitions as their munitions. They were purchased to protect the people of, the, of New Hampshire. And then we learned uh, that Paul Revere made his first midnight ride. He rode from the Boston area up to Portsmouth. And he warned the local patriots that uh, General Gage was going to send up a company of men to reinforce the garrison. And so he arrived on December 13th, and, and they said, those are our arms. So John Langdon, one of our first politicals, and uh, uh, John Sullivan gathered up 400 men, and with some firearms and pitchforks and whatever, they marched on Fort William and Mary. And they took the fort, which was only being guarded by about 11 men, and they were all locals, by the way. So they, they just fired shots over everybody's head, and it came to kind of a hand-to-hand -hand scuffle. Some people were minorly injured, but they took the fort. And they took all the shot and powder. And then the next day, they thought better of what they had done. They went back, and they took the small, all the small cannons as well. <laughs> and those, it's believed that those were at least part of the munitions that the, uh, they were marching on Lexington and Concord to recover. But they were also the cannons that then Colonel Stark used to relieve the Patriots at the bunk Battle of Bunker Hill. Okay, we were the we were the first on the forefront. But then this leads to another thing. You've heard John John uh, Wentworth. Well, John Wentworth was a governor at the time. That was December of '74. We get to the next uh, summer, and the people of Portsmouth. He, he's got a, a loyalist militia officer in his house, and the people of Portsmouth want that man turned out for them so they can do justice on him. And John Wentworth says no. So they rolled a cannon up to his door. <laughs> and they never said whether he actually released the officer or not, but John Wentworth retreated to Fort William and Mary. And then in September, he sailed off for England and later became governor of Nova Scotia. And this brings us to another great first for New Hampshire. We, during that fall of 1775, the, the outer communities out in this area of, of New Hampshire kind of fell into relative anarchy. And the, the uh, men in the legislature in Portsmouth realized that they had a real problem. They suddenly they had one of those, you know, kind of, kind of a ye gods moment. They realized they had no government. They had no, no legitimate authority by which to govern the province. And so on December 21st, they went into session, and they wrote a constitution. And they produced that, they ratified that constitution on January 5th and presented it to, peop to the people. And they created the first free government in the history of the world by a written constitution. And that's us. Thank you, Dan. First of all, I want to say uh, thank you to the number of the other elected officials who are here. I, I see Representative Burt back, and, and then I see Representative Eastman, and I see uh, Representative Hall, uh, Representative Adelman, you already got called that once, but uh, <laughs> if I miss anybody, first of all, I apologize, but uh, right here and where we have someone, I've seen his, uh, Representative Keith Ammon sneaking out the back, I see him. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mention him, so he was going to walk off. <laughs> Oh, okay, yeah, well, we're getting there, we're getting there. Uh, someone who's, if you look at his biography, if you look at his biography, I don't think that there is a board or commission or, or anything here and where that he has not participated in or his <laughs> wife has not participated in. So Representative Neil Kirk is gonna talk a little about where, and as a representative from here and where and Deering, and he remind me, uh, he can talk a little bit about Pine Tree Ride and what it's meant for the, for the town of Ware. Good evening. Um, if you look at the back of the chair in front of you, you'll see the town seal. And on the town seal, you'll see a pine tree <laughs> and the date. Uh, the town of Ware is very proud of its history and its fierce independence, in this case, with respect to England. 
But let's not forget, as Charlie was telling us before, that there's a real economic interest as well as a political interest in this. The two different tree sizes are very important. When the king granted the land, he reserved 24 inch and larger trees for himself. So you could argue that they didn't really belong to the landowners. But I think it was John, uh, John Wentworth change that size down from 24 to 12 inches. And for those of you who know anything about logs, there's a hell of a lot more wood in a larger log than there is in a smaller log. <laughs> and all of a sudden, without the consent of the landowners, something which they had every reason to believe was theirs, these smaller than 12, uh, the 24 inch trees, all of a sudden were not. And a, a smaller than 12 inch tree is not particularly profitable to harvest. So basically what had happened was that all of the usable, really usable timber suddenly became taxable. And as Charlie was saying, that really affected people's livelihoods. Hence, the um, general support for the Pine Tree Riot and in opposition to the sheriff when he came here. Because it wasn't just politics, it was really also economics. In the town, we're proud of this because, although we hear about Fremont, I didn't know about them until tonight, heard about this Exeter riot, we like to think that we were the first to have a pine tree riot, and we take solace in the fact that um, we get a lot of credit in history books, especially <laughs> New Hampshire history books for that. We, we like to think that this was the start of the American Revolution. And in one sense, it and all of the other events that you've heard about tonight were collectively, individually, but collectively, the start of the revolution. The fact that we disagreed with the way that we were being treated from an economic perspective, that money was being taken from us for taxation, not to provide for our benefit, but to take care of the mother country. And that really became an aggravating factor. And when, in the case of Pine Tree Riot, our economic livelihood was adversely affected, um, we spoke out. We're proud of this fact. It's one of the things that we like to think that distinguishes us from many other towns. So when you come to where, as a visitor, please acknowledge the fact that we have this very proud piece of history in, in our past. Uh, welcome to all of you to our town. I'm delighted that you're here tonight, and I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, Mr. Thompson. So, the significance of the Pine Tree Riot isn't just felt here and where, but it's been spreading across New Hampshire, and I know that a lot of people here uh, have been very involved in the message of getting the, the, our history and the Pine Tree Riot out, becoming more public. I can't think of somebody who has a more direct in, involvement in that than somebody who took the time and took the effort to name his company after the incidents of that of April 13th and 14th of, of 1772. So with that, I'd like to introduce Carl Soderberg, who is the founder and brewer of Abel Ebenezer Brewing Company, named after Ebenezer Muslim. celebration of the Pine Tree Riot. Um, I'm actually really excited about this because when I when I found the story years ago, it was not very well known um, out of the you know the thousands of customers that come into our brewery. The vast majority of them, people who grew up in New Hampshire, had actually never even heard of the story. Um, and they were ups they're upset about the fact that they weren't taught it in schools. Um, the Pine Tree Riot, I guess, means a lot to me. Um, it, I guess it goes back to how I became, or I came to where I am now. Um, I'm not from New Hampshire originally. I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, ended up, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, after going to college, I joined the military. You know, I'm a, I'm a big believer that freedom is something that has to be fought for. Um, 
whole different topic, but after four and a half years, I was exhausted for fighting for the wrong things, and uh, really wanted to find a place that felt like home. And New Hampshire, um, people ask me all the time, because my business partner's not from here either, he's from San Diego, and uh, we're always asked, why did we move to New Hampshire? And the best answer I can come up with is, it's the live free or die state, where else would I want to live? It's uh, really is. And it was the place that I wanted to open a business. Um, beer brewing is something I've always been passionate about, but I, I wanted to name the brewery something that meant something to us personally and had a good story behind it. Because when Mike and I drink beer, we like to tell stories. Um, so the, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real big history buff. Back in the military, when I was going through uh, um, military officer training, they beat a lot of the lesser known stories, because a, a lot of why military commanders choose what they do to do um, when, from a tactical standpoint, there's a lot of different events that shape things, and uh, a number of the speakers up here have alluded to a lot of the different individual, smaller riots and rebellions uh, and uprisings that occurred leading up to the American Revolution. And this one really stood out. This one really is, um, I consider it the beginning of the domino effect. Because you can, uh, for more than a hundred years prior to the Pine Tree Riot, there was, there was the occasional uprising in small areas in upstate New York, Virginia, um, the Carolinas. Uh, but this event here, after this got published in newspapers across New England of what had happened, um, it was almost like there was a, a, a riot or an uprising every couple of months leading all the way up to the battle at Fort William and Mary, um, and then leading into the battles at Lexington and Concord. Um, so the Pine Tree Riot and uh, the man who led it, that's really what stuck out to me as, as a small business owner, as someone who works for a living. Um, it's, it really is offensive when you put everything you have into something and then somebody else who has no idea the life you live and the work you do comes in and tells you that what you built the thing that wouldn't exist without your work is now the property of somebody else. So you had loggers up here who were harvesting pine trees for somebody else. Um, and it's, it's, rather, it's a rather abuse of power. Um, and it is offensive. These are the stories that we like to tell when people come in. It's, and it kind of starts that conversation of, you know, if you work for something, if something really belongs to you, is it right for someone else to take it? It's a very simple concept. And that's how you kind of just bring everybody into the idea of liberty. Um, so the, the, I, going into why the Pine Tree Riot was so important for the time, you really had to look at the economics of it. Today, oil is kind of the, the, the great commodity that everybody fights over. Well, timber was that commodity of that day, but it didn't just heat your homes. It also, in this case, built uh, ships. The English uh, maintained the largest naval and merchant force in the country. and. They had completely deforested by the, uh, by the mid-1700s their entire continent trying to maintain it, which is why they passed the law up here. After utilizing the entirety of their resource um, over in Britain, they had to pass the law here, requiring that all of these white pine trees belong to them. So having a, a man who worked for a living, Ebenezer had, eight, had uh, 11 children, so he had a very large family to take care of. Uh, he employed local citizens. He, uh, um, I mean, he actually was, by most accounts, uh, a wealthy man. He had worked very hard. He maintained his own business in the logging world. Mainly defined, like we all talked about, there's a number of loggers who were uh, disobeying the law at the time, and which is really a beautiful thing. Uh, once, the enforcement, once the enforcement came in um, and everybody started paying their fines, uh, it, when, when you uh, read about the actual story, they have kind of the comparison of the loggers from Goffstown and the loggers from Ware. Because the loggers from Gosstown uh, had been seen by the sheriffs um, right before they came out to wear. The, the loggers in Gosstown paid over the fines, they turned over the trees, um, and all the loggers in Ware rallying around Ebenezer Mudgett, the man who was found with, uh, um, well, from what I've been able to find in the history books, 270 illegal cut down logs in his lot, uh, which is pretty egregious. Uh, but it wasn't just. Uh, Ebenezer, um, who was upset, it's the people who worked for him, the people who bought from him. Uh, they all rallied around them, yes, drinking beer and getting drunk and uh, coming up with ideas of how they were, because 
Basically, they go into the bar with the, with the, the mindset of, we're not paying this fucking fine. I'm sorry for the language. I didn't realize this is fine. Um, we're not paying the fine. Um, and then, but it, yes, violence is not always the answer, but I think if they had killed Sheriff Whiting, the Pine Tree Riot probably wouldn't have gotten as much notoriety as it did. Um, the biggest part of the story is not the riot itself, though. The biggest part of the story is what happened afterwards, because the, the British military had to come up into the area to quell the riots. There were, the reports say anywhere from 20 to 40 rioters were involved, if not more, um, and they scattered, they all fled. Uh, Ebenezer had eight conspirators that were basically served as uh, the, the people who were the leaders of this riot, and they all scattered into the woods to try and hide from the British. Uh, but they were all caught, and they were all taken to Portsmouth to trial. Um, and that's the most important part of the Pine Tree Riot, was when they went to trial, because uh, again, the, the, the British, they see the system of government that they had built here during that time as really just an extension of London. <clears throat> so they figure, well, we'll turn them over to the court system we've built over there, to the judges, and the four New Hampshire judges that oversaw the case decided to let the men go free with very minimal fines for basically inciting a riot and uh, threatening the lives of government officials. They were basically given the equivalent of a parking ticket. So that's what, that's what made the news. Um, and that's what really got people going because it was the first instance where nobody was sent to England and beheaded, nobody was thrown in jail. They went back to their normal lives and went back to cutting down pine trees. So th that was the, the, the key mark moment where both the local populace and the local government both collectively civilly disobeyed British oppression. So that's why the Pine Tree Riot sticks out to me and um, to a lot of historians as the key event that kind of started that domino effect of, you know, we actually can rise up and push back. We actually can stand up against this and we can get away with it and build something better. So that story resonated with Mike and I. Um, I mean, you only get to name so many things in life. So we decided to name our company after uh, the man who led the Pine Tree Riots, it's a nice piece of uh, local New Hampshire history that means a lot to us, means a lot to our customers, um, and it's the best story to tell over a fresh craft beer. Thank you. I want to say uh, thank you, that's, that's, you know, people actually taking action on history here in New Hampshire is just so critically important and remembering what that history is. Behind me is part of that history. This is the continental flag behind me. There's another, another one on the wall over there. Um, and that, that flag was the, the flag that uh, many, many, many New Hampshire uh, residents uh, fought under and fought for during the Revolutionary War. Um, I, did want, I finally found him. I don't know where he went to. I just saw him a second ago. Where's, where's Duncan? You take off? In the bathroom. Well, uh, actually, our former, uh, our, 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 our actually wanted to have our former uh, summer policy fellow, Duncan Taylor, an, an Air Force vet. Uh, actually, one thing we didn't do at the beginning is uh, I want to ask you to lead us in the pledge on, the, on our American flag. So, Duncan, if you would. Sorry, I missed it at this point, but he's he's small, so it's kind of easy to hear some stuff. <laughs> so thank you, Duncan. Uh, I, I actually now want to take a moment to uh, to introduce someone who actually helped us secure this, secure this venue. So if you like being here, you can thank him. Um, that's uh, Howard Kalugin. Uh, where is he? Oh, there he is. Howard is it lives here and where? And he's going to talk a little bit about the pine tree riot and what it means to wear and to him. Well, welcome everybody. The reality is I didn't do anything to help you get here. My wife did. So if you appreciate it, say hello to Mark. Like Carl, Martha and I moved here from San Diego. We came here last year. We haven't even been here one year yet. So there's something that's attractive to people. I'm moving here to where? Not just where, but perhaps all of New Hampshire, because it is the live free or die state. Carl, though, also stole my thunder because I wanted to talk with you about the trial. The trial and the very light fines that everybody received. You see, that's because the judges who lived here in New Hampshire understood the concept. 
that just government derives its powers from the consent of the governed. And people did not consent to taking their property without any representation, or at all for that matter. In fact, that's the whole concept behind the idea of no taxation without representation. It's that the government is not just if it does not have the consent of the government. And frankly, I was disturbed to learn when I went up to Concord that they're talking about creating an income tax for us here in New Hampshire. That would negate the entire reason for us moving here. Well, one of the main reasons for moving here to New Hampshire and leaving the nice weather of San Diego. And yet, you see, they say, well, but there isn't enough money to pay for all the things that we're doing. There are 41 states in this country with an income tax. Not one of those states has enough money to do everything they want to do. The United States government just collected a record amount of taxation from us. It isn't enough for everything they choose to do. One of the candidates is talking about another trillion dollars worth of income tax to be taken from us. There's never enough money to do everything that you can do if you're the government and you just choose to do everything that you, you can think of. The key is that it has to have the consent of the governed. And that's a contrast from the divine right of kings. The divine right of kings that the English had and that all the European powers at that time had was that if it's something that the king could think of doing, it gets done. It's the king's will. He gets to do what he wants to do, basically. A little bit, little bit of limitation there with parliament, but not much. Well, frankly, I think that the way to prevent the government from always doing everything that it can think of doing is for us as individuals to do the good things that have to be done in our communities. That we should band together and get things done that when we see something that has to be done, and then we don't have to call upon the government to do it. We don't have to put excess demands upon our government, whether it's at the federal level or at the state level, or frankly, the local level, if we as individuals will band together and get something done, as my wife Martha did when she helped reserve this place for all of us. Thank you all very much for welcoming us here today. They say you leave the best for last, and, and this particular day we've done just that, in this particular event. Um, it's always nice when you have an honorary chairman who actually happens to be a tree farmer and you're talking about the pine tree riot, because I promise you, no one can bring more knowledge about pine trees. And in fact, if you look down below, you'll see a few of Tom's, uh, Tom's handiwork. But I think it's important to understand uh, that, that Tom Thompson has been leading the fight for limited government, for more freedom, and for good trees. For generations. So with that, I want to lead, lead it with our honorary chairman, Tom Thompson. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for everyone uh, joining us tonight. And uh, I'd like to just take a second and uh, thank Neil Kirk for coming up and speaking, Representative Kirk, and all the other representatives here. Uh, I tip my hat to you for willing to roll up your sleeves and serve the people of this state. Thank you. Yay. It was a couple of years ago that I spoke at Americans for Prosperity. Uh, I think it was on the same day, the 13th. Uh, it was, happened to be in Manchester. It was a Saturday. Uh, there were probably 750 to 800 people there. And uh, we had C-SPAN, and there were a lot of individuals there that who were, have been running for president uh, this term. And I talked about a little issue, uh, happens, you probably don't, have never heard of this, uh, Obamacare. <laughs> well, that was on a Saturday. On Monday, a letter was sent from the IRS in Manchester, New Hampshire, and we were audited. We'd been audited the year before. We went through the two and a half to three months of paying, if anyone's gone through that, plus paying your account again, and finally get the letter from the IRS the year before, plus that year, that we owed nothing. So, 
you are my witnesses tonight if I get a letter <laughs> in Friday of what I said. I am just exercising my First Amendment right. I'm here with my wife, uh, Sheila, uh, and our grandson, Jaden, and his mom, Christine. Uh, we make up four generations, uh, or Jaden is the fourth generation of tree farmers in my family, my father and mother being the first. At an early age, uh, I was telling Charlie this, uh, my father encouraged my two older brothers and I to buy a piece of land. That was in 1956. I was 11 years old at the time. <laughs> that was back when we were, were making money. Uh, it's, uh, there was a bounty on porcupines, 50 cents per bounty, or per porcupine. Anyways, we pooled our money together, along with other things, and uh, we bought 125 acres of woodland for $235. Two years ago, I sold, I, I bought my two older brothers out, and I can't uh, tell you uh, how much they paid in capital gains, but it was a lot more than what we paid for that. <laughs> I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about some forest facts in the state of New Hampshire, which I think uh, you'll be interested in. Uh, but our forest, in, back in, in 56, when I bought that first piece of property, I and I like working in the woods. I don't know if there's, a, yeah, there's, there's a picture of uh, our horse, Babe, and myself at 15 years old. We enjoyed cutting spruce and fir, hauling it over to uh, Franconia paper. And that's how we, we made our money to pay for different things. And uh, I enjoy owning land, and after I got out of high school, I started buying forest land wherever I could. Uh, oh, whenever I could, as far as uh, having enough money to put aside for that. And even my wife will tell you that there were times that I was buying woodland when we didn't have the money, but uh, we somehow came up with it. Anyways, we own uh, just under 3,000 acres of the Thompson family tree farm. So I know a little bit about what these folks and where and others that were going through when their pine trees were taken away from them. Uh, and you look at the 24 inch and the 12 inch, uh, if you talk about it, it, it doesn't sound like a big deal. But look at the size of that, and as, as different speakers have told you, uh, that 24 inch is going to bring a whole lot more money to the landowner than that 12 inch. In New Hampshire, we are the, the second most heavily forested state in the United States, Maine being number one. Uh, Vermont and it's tied with uh, West Virginia but the New England area was uh, was some of the best uh, pine trees in, in, in the world uh, we have we're blessed by natural regeneration we don't plant our trees we manage them it's just like our uh, the garden in your backyard we we weed it and thin it, and if you don't do that with your own God, you know what you end up with, it's a, a bunch of trash. But what we're trying to do is release those healthy stems like that big pine tree and grow it even bigger, because uh, if we can, we know we're gonna make more. Uh, in New Hampshire, uh, the second most heavily state, uh, there's about 82% of New Hampshire that's all forested. Uh, out of that, Three quarters of all of the forest land in the state of New Hampshire are owned by private forest landowners, such as uh, my family. It's not the federal government, it's not the state, and it's not the non-profit uh, organizations. It's the landowners, and we are the ones that pay the taxes on the properties. The New Hampshire forest industry is the oldest continuous industry in the state of New Hampshire. Now, there are some that will say, no, it's the fishing. We believe they came here, they took out their racks, and they started cutting trees down to either keep warm and or build a shelter. And then they thought about uh, feeding their family. But it is truly the largest continuous uh, industry in the state of New Hampshire. Today, it employs over 6,200 employees with a payroll of over $242 million. The total dollars generated annually in the state of New Hampshire forest industry, both primary and secondary, 
is $1.39 billion. That's B, billion. It's a huge industry and uh, we uh, are faced with some of the same problems back then. Today, uh, we have, every time we sever a tree or cut a tree, it's called a timber tax, it's 10% of the stumpage value on that tree goes to the town in which the tree is cut in. Uh, and that's been in place for, for many, many years. Uh, we also deal with uh, different rules and regulations, as any business person knows. Uh, it, it's smothering our businesses. Uh, and, and one is the friendly EPA. The other is uh, Department of Environmental Services. They're, they're rules and regulations that they just keep churning out over and over again. And unfortunately, the, those rules have the same uh, weight as law does. And uh, those, are, those are some of the things that are, are uh, hampering uh, tree farmers, uh, landowners that, that do forestry work. Our son is in the business, uh, in, in the timber harvesting business. And, and there isn't a day that goes by, whether it be him or any other business in this state, that doesn't break a rule or regulation because you can't have enough attorneys and accountants standing or, or on your staff to, to keep, keep ahead of it. The, uh, the pine trees that you see in front of us, the 24 inch and the 12 inch, you heard that in the very beginning, uh, it was only the 24 inch. And then, I think it was in the early uh, 1700s, there were a couple different acts that they passed. Uh, and, and it really came to a head in uh, 1772 uh, with the 12 inch. And what was happening was, as you've heard, the, the landowner, first they lost the 24 inch. Although I think some of those trees were cut and when they went down to the Ware Mill, uh, they, they put them right on through the sawmill, but they didn't want to be caught. So they split those boards in half. So when, when they were checked on, two 12 inch boards. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure that sort of thing goes on today too. But the, the word got out that there was, the, White pine trees in the state of New Hampshire, in New England, were some of the, they were light in weight, they were tall, they were, they were strong, and they were easy to work, and it became a real uh, sought after material, not only for the mass, but also for other parts of the shipbuilding industry. And that was one of the first uh, industries uh, with the white pine trees, or the forest industry, in, in the state of New Hampshire. <coughs> I put a couple notes together I just want to share with you, uh, which goes along with some of the other talks, but in, in where uh, the sparks flew on the morning of April 14th, or it could have been, we don't really know what time they went in after the sheriff, but uh, it was either the 13th or the 14th early. Uh, and where New Hampshire went, Ebenezer Mudgett uh, and other sawmill owners, which Ebenezer was the leader of the saw of, of the mill owners of, of the town of Ware, and other landowners pushed back on the king's greedy assumption that he owned virtually all of the white pines that grew on their land. The Ware pine tree riot started sparks, which smoldered for the next year, leading up to the Boston Tea Party and the American Revolution. God bless America and the patriots of Ware from long ago, who had the backbone to stand up and push back. We can all learn a lesson from the pine tree riots. And some 244 years later, we have a greedy government here now who has lost sight of we the people who are in charge, not we the government. We need to be vigilant. We need to get involved in issues, whether it be at our local level or a state level and our, our national level. 
And I try to go down and testify on bills in, in Concord, and I think it's important. I know I've seen a lot of you down there, but it is really important to become engaged and involved in, in our, our daily, not only our daily life, because it, it's, we've got to do more than that. Because there are people in, in Concord who are passing laws that we may not be uh, so fond of. But if we're not at the table, then we're going to lose by default for sure. I want to push back as those patriots did. But leave the horses alone. <laughs> I think Charlie's right. Uh, we, we have to do it a different way today uh, and, and, and do it a legal way, and we can. And I know that the representatives here uh, will tell you that they're, over their years that they've been in Concord, they've seen different individuals come to Concord and testify. Just, you know, people that don't have time to take that day off from, from work or shut down their equipment to go to, to Concord and testify. And, and sit, sit there for hours and hours while the lobbyists talk first, and then we get to, to go up and talk. But they will tell you that some people that can come down there and tell a real story, how it impacts them or their business or their family, will change the mind and change that law. I'd like to ask my grandson, who's here with me tonight, to come up uh, for a second. Jaden, can you come up? I think it's important for, for us with gray hair to get our children and our grandchildren involved. And Jaden has been, uh, actually, he's been my axe carrier. Any event that I go to, uh, when Jaden can, can do it, he goes with me carrying the axe, uh, which, which was his great-grandfather's axe uh, back in the late 60s and early 70s when he campaigned for governor. But Jaden, dad is, or our son, Stacy, uh, is in the timber harvesting business and, and other uh, dirt business in Orford. He grew up in Orford and started at Jaden's age, cutting firewood and selling it locally. And Jaden has just started that, his little firewood business. When Stacy was 19 years old, he had socked away enough money so he bought his first house, and the next year he bought his first skitter and started his own business, Thompson Timber Harvesting. And he is the largest employer in the town of Warford outside of our interstate school system <laughs> and he pays taxes so it's important for me at my age with everything that's going on in this in this state and in this country somehow i'll muddle through it but i know that our children and our grandchildren's future is really at stake and I want him to have the same lifestyle that I did at 12 years old and be able to go out and buy that first piece of land and enjoy, work hard, be smart, save your money, and, and, and have a good life. And then put, if he wants to go into business or, or work with his dad or whatever and put other people to work, that's what this country is all about. Yet we have... Some people will say this. I'm not going to say it. Because what I told you early on. But some people say that we even have or a person in the White House who thinks he's a king. That's right. And we need, we have an election coming up. I don't care who you vote for, but just think about it. The chain, we need to change the direction of this country so that your grandkids, my grandkids, can live a better life because we are really headed in the wrong direction. And have that, you know, like the folks here in Ware, way back when, they were hardworking men and women, and uh, I want that to happen for, for 
Jaden and, and, and his kids and grandkids. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Tom, and, and thank you, Jaden, just be, for driving the point home. Um, America's Prospect, you probably see the, the banners next to me. It's freedom-oriented, activist-supported, community-driven. That's what we are. Um, from our perspective, if we didn't have grassroots activists and supporters who got out there and made a difference every day, there wouldn't be any reason for us to exist. We exist to help people like you get out and take action as effectively and efficiently as possible. So with that, I want to leave you with this. Tax day's coming up. I, I guess technically it's Monday. <coughs> Some people still think it's Friday. It's technically Monday. First of all, make sure you get your taxes done if you have to. Um, but, but make sure you think about where that money's going and what you're paying for. What are you paying for? Do we have a disconnected leader, a disconnected leadership, a broken Washington that's paying for? Is that something you're comfortable with? No. Ask the same question in Concord. Do we have people who are connected to the needs and values of, uh, of, your, of your community? Because those are the people that we're fighting for every day. We're fighting to give everybody a chance at the American dream. Whether it's, whether it's Jaden or whether it's Tom. We want to give them everybody a chance to have, have an opportunity that, we, that many people did to start your own business. Whether it's Abel Lebanese or Brewing Company. Whether it's Thompson Tree Farm. Everybody deserves that chance to live their American dream. Whether it's going, in, going into the arts. Whatever it takes. But we want to preserve that opportunity. We need your help. We do need your help. First of all, I know a lot of people here do help, and I appreciate the hard work that you guys, you guys put in. But if you, do, if you haven't gotten involved, you haven't taken action, do so. Take action. Get involved. I know we have a number of our field directors here. Uh, I see a few of them. I see Mike Sissio in the back. Mike, raise your hand. I see Patrick Shaheen. I see Sarah Scott. And our grassroots director, Ross Conley, back there as well. Reach out to them. Say, how can I get involved? How can I help ensure that we have the opportunity for the American dream that maintains for generations to come. How do we make sure that our children and our grandchildren can maintain this opportunity? How can we make sure that New Hampshire is better? How can we make sure New Hampshire is uh, the most competitive, the most free that we can be? And how do we push back against that overregulation? I think, I think Tom is right. No horses will be, will be harmed in the making of this freedom. <laughs> But, but it's absolutely essential, it's absolutely essential that everybody here gets involved and stay involved. So with that, I want to thank you. There's still some food left. I think there's still some cookies left. So make sure you take a chance to uh, speak to some of our, our fantastic staff. And thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you.